forever. Dog. Hi, everybody. It's Michelle Collins. It's a brand new episode of Midnight Snack. Uh, ironic this week, given that it's Yom Kippur. Midnight snacks are one of the few treats um, we could really have this week, as the Jewish peoples would uh, agree. Uh, Hi, it's Michelle Collins. I'm here with uh, Dan Acton, who's going to chat with me a little bit. We have a big guest coming on today, someone who Dan and I have both worked with, but I've actually known this guest. uh, We went to college together, so I've known him. Oh, I didn't know that. You didn't know Gabe and I went to college together in in general? Yeah, Uh, we went to school. Uh, We were... Uh, Columbia University students at the same, roughly the same time. Gabe Liebman, one of the um, executive producers of arguably the best show on television, Pen15. It's the funniest. Yeah. He's just the funniest. Like Gabe is. He's this is, the best. He's the best. Yeah. This he's, is one of those episodes yeah. <laughs> that I'm like, oh, like sometimes, you know, you have people on, you're like, all right, I got to prep. I got to do this with Gabe. I'm like, I'm not no, prepping no, for Gabe. Fine. I'm not, I'm not even going to take prep for Gabe. I want everything. I want it all. <laughs> I'm not prepping and I'm not prepping. Dan, can I say that without getting canceled? Uh, let me check. Oh, you Do were you mind? canceled. Oh, no. Already? The episode hasn't even come s- out yet. My funny thing that I was going to say about Gabe was like, uh, you know, he's the smartest and the funniest and the best. And he also has like really great legs, I remember. Oh, yeah. He um, does have good legs. Yeah. I'm so. going to bring that up. <laughs> Now, because we sure. worked together at VH1, but I'll save that for when Gabe comes on. We worked on, um, but we worked on a morning show with Gabe, and that was it was just a fun time with him. Yeah, it was. You know, it's funny with Yom Kippur. Like, I come from Jewish people, but we're not remotely religious at all. And actually, mm. my parents, my mother especially, my joke is she's always shunned the religion because I think <laughs> having grown up with like kosher parents and. Uh, I mean, I hate to bring the mood down, but here I go again. Um, you know, parents who survived the Holocaust. I think that it, it's heavy. Like, it's a lot of heavy stuff yeah, surrounding yeah, yeah. the religion for my both my parents. But, I mean, I don't know if we were the only Jewish family when I was growing up that would close all the shades uh, in our home and then eat almost twice as much. I mean, we used to eat. <laughs> we used to eat so much on Yom Kippur. I, I'll never forget because we would have the dinner, you know, like as though we right, were going right. to fast. So we'd stuff ourselves, you know, at (laughs) night and then the sun would just be peeking over the horizon and my father would be in the kitchen making challah French toast every year. It was like a tradition (laughs) for my family. Yom Kippur, look, it's John Stewart has a joke about it that, you know, we can sin all year long and then for one day we don't eat and that even in sin we pay retail. And then we like cleanse ourselves for a single day. It's one of the best jokes. Dan, what's new in your life? Let's talk about it. I've had quite the week. How have you been? I've been having a great week. Uh, my new job continues uh, to be really cool. I'm having a lot of fun. And uh, I'm just exhausted at the end of the day. So I like kind of walk around the neighborhood and then uh, pass out at about 9 a.m. Yeah, at a bar. At 9 a.m. at a bar. Every time yeah, I talk yeah. to Dan, uh, if we have our evening chat, um, I'll say, what are you doing? He goes, just walking around looking for beer. Every time you're, I'm just walking around <laughs> looking for beer. I'm like, well, I hope you find some, honestly. Um you know what I noticed this week? And I actually, so, you know, I do my morning show in Sirius. And for a few weeks, I wasn't wearing a bra because I just was like, I, I had really given up. I really given up. I cleaned my apartment. My place is looking good. I still have some more work left to do. I'm always cleaning, but then I'll also like horribly lazy. Um, and right. I put a bra on the last two mornings and I got DMs from people going, the show is better with a bra on. <laughs> And I'm wondering what that is about. And actually, you know what's funny? They're not wrong. I wasn't offended. I actually agree. And I wonder what it is about. And if people who are listening who do like Zoom meetings from home or or who work from home, I really believe that when you do get a little bit dressed or even, uh, I'm telling you, just I don't put pants on still. I have like a nightgown, bra undies. That bra just, it lifts here, but then it lifts here. My mental health, it lifts as well. (laughs) You know what? Let's just move on to advice. So, you know, I'm I'm a big etiquette person, Dan. I don't know. I think yes. I brought this up even this week. This is what I'm saying. I'm running out. Maybe I'm running out of steam. Maybe I'm running out of steam. Oh, here's an exciting thing I'm doing this week. Uh, I'm going to be, if for you serious subscribers out there, I'm going to be on Radio Andy Theater. Oh, fun. I'm excited about it. And I'm playing, yeah. um, unsurprisingly, I'm playing Luann uh, or... You can have a nickname for her if you want, but it does make sense. I think structurally it makes sense. Vocally, it ties together. Sure. I wonder if the fact that I know Luann is going to affect my performance. Like maybe I don't want to be like 
too husky. Because also I'm sensitive yeah. to people making fun of like when they called right, her Lou right. Man, I was like, that's not funny. Cause like I've been there. I'm a little bit I'm a little bit like that too, but it's just out of affection for her. I'm like, you know. I like no, I love let's, her. Let's, let's, yeah, let's reel it in. Oh, I'm reeling <laughs> it, honey. That. Real big fish. <laughs> reeling it all the way in. That's gonna be on Wednesday. I'm excited about it. But why I bring her up is she, when it comes to etiquette, mm. she's really cornered the market on modern day etiquette. And you know, when I was growing up, we had Miss Manners. Well, we had yes. my mother. Let's start there. And, <laughs> you know, the problem with my mom is that my mom set such a high expectation when it came to table manners. And did I never tell you that? You don't know this? My, no, no. My mother used to drill it into my brother and I growing up about how to behave in restaurants, how to eat properly, how very almost like debutante's ball style, like really walked well, us through I'm- that. I remember the story about the black napkin that is the funniest thing. The black napkin story, which, side note, I wore a denim jumpsuit and (laughs) asked, because it was a black one, I knew that it was going to just be a magnet for Lent. And the waiter was this Italian guy who could not, like, pry his eyes away from my nips, which happened to be fully out. But he was like, I, um, he was like, uh, Madame, we do not have a black napkin, but I bring you a lint roller. So he brought me, I thought, I thought like he went, I called it backstage, whatever, in the back of the restaurant. He yeah. found the lintiest napkin, lintier than the one my friend had. He was like, enjoy. He put it on my arm. I was like, okay. I lifted it up. It was like Velcro to my pants. There was so much lint on it. I could not believe it. And then I said, oh, can I get that lint roller? I mean, I looked crazy. And he goes, eh, I want a moment. Eh, un momento. He went in the back. Comes out with the shittiest dollar store. You know when you have the lint rollers where when you peel the shit off, it comes off in like dribs and drabs, not right, in full right, right. sheets. Yeah. Y'all, I was driven and driving that lint off me. It did not feel good to do. I'll be very honest with you, but... Um, it, it was a, just a very funny meal overall. That black napkin, she wasn't wrong about the black napkin story. Right, right. And for those who don't know, I don't know if I've ever told it on this podcast, just Google it. I mean, it's, I'm not going to retell my stories <laughs> 1500 times here, but no, but really, and it's funny because I'll tell you something, it created such a high level of expectation with my own friends. And like, if I go on a date with a guy and he's, he behaves in an ugly manner at the table yeah. It really is a big turnoff for me. I, I get very sensitive to how people eat and what they do at the table. Well, what's the tipping point? Because I know like things like, oh, you use the silverware at the outside. Now, first, that I don't care about. Move, yeah. Oh, well, then what's the... Here are things that really piss me off. Um, yeah. So first of all, uh, this uh, people are going to be offended by this. I already know that I'm going to hear from people going, I do that and it's not wrong. Say it. There's an American <laughs> way of eating. And this is, again, str- I blame my mother for all of this. There's yeah. an American way of eating where you take your fork and your knife and instead right. of the European way, which is you cut it and then eat it and then cut again with yeah. your fork in your left hand, Americans, yeah. some will cut it, put the knife down, put the fork in their right hand and take a bite. Yeah. And for me, that doesn't work. Like that is just, it, it's backwards. First of all, it's an extra step for no reason. You're not a chimp. You can learn how to do it the right way. And in fact, I think a chimp would know how to do it the right way. I think it's actually like a fake thing that American advice people made up. I know what advice person said to do that. I've never read that. Like There's etiquette like a, experts. Yeah. I used to read these like 1930s etiquette books. And, and they, they said would... to change it. Yes. And I think it's an American thing to like distinguish us from like Europeans. But I, it makes no sense. I choose not to believe that. Um, And maybe this is okay. like coming off as incredibly bougie of me to be like, but that, (laughs) that to me is like very, it's ugly. I don't like that. Um, I'll tell you one that this is just me because I'm nuts and you know, I, I'm really love having a nice table and I love Mm -hmm. facing out. A gentleman should always let the woman face out. Okay. Have you never heard that? Uh, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I went on a terrible first date recently and he faced out and I, to be fair, I got there after him, but also so fine. I get it. But that should be something that all men should learn. You allow, and I'm speaking here in this, in a hetero dating world that you allow right, right, right. the woman to face out. I just don't I like know that. what that's about. I think that's it. I mean, I realize, you know, You're I don't right. know. there is some, yeah, there is something weird about it. If I saw uh, like two people on a date in a corner and, and the woman had to like face the corner. Yeah, it's very, it's the there, woman faces something. out. It's ugly. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, there's something strange. If you that. pour okay. water for yourself, obviously you pour it for other people at the table. I'm very big on that. Um, oh, there, I love that. Obviously, there's just, 
there's just a way that you behave that's thoughtful and it's elegant. Yeah. And yeah. I'm telling you, if you go to restaurants, that's why I get sensitive when I see sometimes back when we could travel the world, you know, you see an American in another country and they're, to me, it's like, watch. I mean, Coco, my girl, Coco the gorilla, may she rest in peace, uh-huh. has better manners than most Americans who travel. I'm like, I was looking around, I'm going, what is, what are you guys doing here? Like, don't make a scene. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. there's just a way. There's just a way. I don't know how no, to put I it. I, I put my elbows on the table often, which I know is considered ugly. I do that, I think, because I'm long-armed, so I never know where to put my arms. So that's yeah. maybe that. But I admit that I, I'm not perfect, listener. But yeah, I just get tired. I, that's the thing. I get so tired. I have such a heavy head. I mean, <laughs> I told you that this the hat woman measured my head, and I had a 24-inch head. And that's I Googled right. that because I, I mean, was like, that doesn't seem like that <laughs> big and then i googled it and it's like 24 inch head men's xxl it's like come <laughs> on so my head is heavy i i do have to be fair tree trunk neck but you know it's still like i feel like i couldn't have a skinny neck with this head it just occurred to me okay let's get to this question so this is miss manners this week uh, miss manners now is a woman named judith martin so here's the question dear miss manners if we're hosting a birthday party at our home for a niece or nephew this doesn't make, I already hate this question. And I'm sorry, I'm reading it to you guys. Uh, is there a polite way to suggest to the parent not to bring the biggest cake they can find? May I already stop this right here? Uh, are they saying that their their sibling is bringing a big cake? It sounds to me nephew, like they're saying yeah. their sibling. Why don't you just say, my sister had a party at my house and brought a big cake. Why do I have to get the whole family tree out Could, to figure out? I don't know. It could be the sister-in-law or the brother-in-law. I don't know. It says other, oftentimes, like how often are they doing it is my question. Stop hosting it at your house. Family. Stop like host- the big love family. It's the Duggars. <laughs> the Duggars wrote this. How often are you, if by the way, if the cake is a problem, stop hosting parties at your house. I mean, let me just crack this code right away. Two sentences in. <laughs> oftentimes we're left with a huge cake to fit in our fridge. <laughs> Innuendo. We've all been there, right, Dan? <laughs> I can't fit your cake, my friend. There's not enough room. You have to move those eggs, which we actually don't. So horrible, which we actually don't want once the party's over. I feel guilty well, for throwing it out. Why do you make the people take it home? I guess it's, yeah. I get that it's a hassle to bring home. They don't want the temptation, but that has nothing to do with me. I feel bad telling a parent I mean, this is ridiculous. What kind of cake to get their kid? But I have limited space in my fridge. This is the dumbest fucking question. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, listener, that you had to listen to this. And Tracy, I'm mad you put it in the packet. Because honestly, that is so stupid. Just say, hey. I mean, what are we living in? Just some, what is this? Throw it uh, out. Throw it out. What are we living? What's that movie that I hated with Amy Adams with the aliens and the egg? Oh, uh, arrival. arrival. What is this? Yeah. Arrival? What do you have to hold a sign up with some coffee rings on it? <laughs> Just to speak a fucking English and say, listen. <laughs> I fucking hated that movie. I'm the only person who hated Arrival. Everyone saw it. They were like, groundbreaking stuff. I was like, are you kidding me? They're going to pretend they can. And by the way, the scenes where she was hacking the language, I'm air quoting because it was literal Dunkin' Donut coffee rings on paper. They didn't even explain. She was like, yes, that is that is the letter T. Like, they didn't explain. Like, what? You can't do that. I hated that movie so much. I was so bored. Oh, you liked it? Yeah, I like I, I figured. I knew you did. I knew you did. Yeah, I great. said, yeah. Anyway, just tell the person, <laughs> hey, I, I don't have room in the fridge. Bring enough cake for the people. Whatever's left, you take home immediately. No, if it's a huge cake, it's just a sheet cake. Just say, like, oh, that's great. And say goodbye. This looks great. And then just once they're gone, no, throw it I, away. Don't, I feel bad throwing food out like that, too. Well, maybe get, bring it to a homeless shelter. I don't know. I'm being serious. Put it up for the birds. I don't know. How big is it? L- kill the birds, honestly. I say kill the local birds. Let's listen to her answer. <laughs> I already hate this. I, I hate it so much. Oh, she says, if if they must get a big one to take the leftovers home, she says, can I ask them to downsize the cake? You know what? I need to do an updated manners column because this shit is, I'm, I'm, my blood is boiling and this is not the energy I wanted to welcome Gabe Liebman to the show with, but it's happening. Gentle reader, I'm fuming, I'm fuming. You may not ask the people to bring a smaller cake. How fucking dare she? But by the way, is anyone writing this or reading this Jewish? I mean, a Jewish person would be like, don't bring cake. I I don't have got room for the cake. (laughs) Don't bring the cake because we are a people of language. We like to explain how we feel. Many times it it hurts us. Many times it really (laughs) works against us. But in this case, I think it would help. But you maybe rebox what is left at the end of the party and hand it to your brother or sister on their way that's, out of the door. That's Done. a good idea. That's a good idea. Protests that they have no place to put it should be met with a knowing. I completely understand. It's just if it stays here, it's going to get thrown out. And perhaps Liam, the name she picked, would want another piece. I hate the, I hate the newest manners. I, maybe it's the old <laughs> one. I don't know. 
Uh, I feel like this has been one of the biggest wastes of my time in the history of manners question asking. <laughs> give the give the cake to a homeless. You know, sometimes you just gotta give it away. <sighs> I like the idea. That's that's another thing that I would actually do is like just like have it packed up and as they're yes. leaving, just put it in their hands and then goodbye. Take it. Yeah, it's fine. Someone told me a story recently. Um, if we're going to get into manners, and I know we're going to have Gabe any second, but I want to ask this to you because mm-hmm. someone was telling me how they had a dinner party. I'll keep it vague. And uh, but I guess they met outside for it because obviously it's a pandemic. So they met at a place where you put the order in, you put the order in and then you pick up the order. It wasn't like a seated right. table side service. Right. And my friend paid for everything and there were like 10 people there. So it was, exp- it was like hundreds of dollars. Yeah. But then they did the after party at their house. So obviously nobody brought wine and no one offered to pay either. And one guy actually brought a thing of Tito's vodka that ended up not getting used. And at the end of the night, he went in the fridge and grabbed it. And I was like, well, that's okay. terrible. That's that unheard sucks. of. That is an yeah. unheard of thing. Yeah, yeah. But at first I was like completely incensed. Like, how could they not offer any money? Yeah. But I think it's like when someone just goes and orders like 50 chicken wings and this, that and the other, it would be kind to say, do it. What do we owe you? Yes. And the truth is, my friend should then say, don't worry about it. That's just the truth. Yeah, but you if need they're to hosting, have that interaction. Yeah, you, you, have, have, to you offer. have to have that back and forth. Of course, they didn't of offer, course. but also he was pissed about that. And then he was mad they didn't bring anything. Well, the guy taking it was like, I mean, that's unheard of to me. I said, that's yeah. a true animal. But <laughs> things like this get me out of bed. I brought a bottle of vodka to uh, our mutual friend's uh, house. in you know, they bought a house upstate. Oh, yeah. And uh, they, I found out that they hate vodka oh, and they never God. drink it. So I felt bad, but I was like, well, can I take this back? (laughs) It seems like that's okay. The friend I was talking about was you. And I didn't want to bring it up. I didn't want to call you out. But Dan, it was you. Um, They called me. They are mutual friends. And I said, well, I think you made a huge mistake. Um, No, you know what? Actually, at this Rosh Hashanah dinner that I went to last week, um, my friend who invited me was like, and it was very small. It was like a family, my friend and I. And she was like, uh, only bring kosher wine. Now, I don't know if people are familiar with kosherness and kosher things. I always say the only kosher thing that I eat are hot dogs because I, I'd like there to be like nice lips. Like if you're going to use, you know, the (laughs) lips of a cow, put some gloss on it, you know, and that to me is what (laughs) kosher meat does. But I went to Costco to buy the wine, not realizing that kosher wine, you really have to go to like a specialty wine store for the kosher section, but also kosher wine sucks. Like it's, it sucks. So I didn't have time. There he is. There's our boy. There's good. Hi. Hi. Hey, Wait. Oh my God, Dan <laughs> Hey, how are you? What? <laughs> Wait, this is What's nice. He's more excited to see Dan than me. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> he, he literally <laughs> said he was like, hi, and then went, Hi, Michelle. Dan! <laughs> Well, I'm hurt, and, but I'll continue with the podcast. Oh, my Hi, God. Gabe. Okay. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> oh, my God. How are you? Oh, I'm so good. I was, we were talking. I'm going to obviously give you a professional introduction in moments, but while we have Gabe and Dan, and what a beautiful reunion. I was saying we all work together. Yeah. <laughs> this is crazy. It's really funny. It's so crazy. <laughs> Look at us all these two years later. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, I'm Morgan Freeman. I have like skin tags. I'm like, yeah, just quick two years. They really flew by. Uh, oh my gosh. Well, we were saying, Gabe, before, um, before you got here, how much fun we all had working together, but that we've just all known each other for decades. Decades. And it was fun. It was such a funny, weird world. Yeah. We would have to the wake 15, up. 1515 of it all. Oh my God. I mean, do you remember the... The run through for the first episode was on January 1st. No. Is oh, that yeah, true? That's, yeah, that's right. It was yeah. New Year's Day. <gasps> yes. Be at 1515 yeah. at like 5 a.m. New Year's I Day. Remember I remember that. I never you, forget that. I was not so there funny. for that. I was not working there yeah. then. Well, you were brought on to save the show. Yeah. <laughs> by the way, by the way, any executives listening, big mistake. When, when you bring me on, that is like, I am the kiss of fucking death. I mean, I... <laughs> We need to get some real talents up in here. They flew me from L.A. to come work on that show. And honestly, it's funny because I work on such an early show now that now waking up at six is like normal. But having to be there at six, right? We had to get in at six. That fucking sucked. It was was called Big Morning Buzz Live. And I don't think any of us talk to the host anymore. Lovely as she is, we just don't really keep in touch with her. But um, we we made some good friends on that show. It was fun. It was really fun. 
It was like a little fun, weird experiment. I mean, they had never done a thing like that. The set was the elevator bank. Literally, <laughs> I'll never forget people. It, she'd be like, hey, everybody, it's Carrie. And I'd be like, ding. And some second yeah. would step out and be like, am I on? T-? It was a live show. Like, be like, am I on television right now? I mean, it was sort of actually avant-garde. I had to sign a release to like get off on that floor. I always had yeah. to sign a release to get off backstage. <laughs> <laughs> That's my kind of release. All right. an NBA, baby. <laughs> well, listen. Um, all right. Let's wrap with Dan. I will tell you this. Right. Dan Acton, you know, we love you. Follow him on Instagram at Dan underscore Acton. He's look how good he looks, Gabe. No, he looks great. What? Always has. Oh, thanks. Always such a looker. I, <laughs> I was complimenting your legs like earlier. Uh, I remember from like Big Morning. My Buzz, legs? Like, yes. I'm wearing shorts right now. I mean, kick a leg right. up for us, Gaby. Kick a leg up. Yeah, you look, you look great. <laughs> he said it to us. I was like, he did. You, you always had very beautiful calves and muscular gams, Gabe. Yep. Yep. It's, it's a fat person thing. You got it. You got, you, you got the legs <laughs> no, no, no. From, 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 from the work. <laughs> The work of getting yourself around. Oh no, I knew a girl. I went to school with such a nice girl who had that body, and I always felt like God, you know, because I'm I've never been thin in my life, but I always was grateful to be mostly proportioned. You know what I'm saying? Other than my yeah. huge fat ass, I was like, well, my my ass is doing a lot of work too, people. Okay, I'm doing a lot of work. Dan, we love you. We'll talk to you All soon. Right, love you back. Bye. Bye. Guys. Bye. Bye. Hey, Midnight Snackers, I'm here to remind you that there's an online professional counseling service out there for you right now if you need it. Listen, everyone knows times are tough. You've heard me talk about how this pandemic has affected my own life on this very podcast. All everyone really wants is for this nightmare time to be over. But as we sort through the unknown, we're finding our own ways to work through this. And if you're looking for some additional help during this time, why not try BetterHelp? BetterHelp takes the time to assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist that you can start communicating communicating with in just under 48 hours. You just log into your account to send a message to your counselor, and you can do this on your very own schedule. You can also schedule weekly video or phone sessions with your counselor to chat. And if you get matched with one that you just don't connect with, don't worry, because you can switch it and it's free and easy to do so. Plus, it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. So visit BetterHelp.com slash Michelle. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P. And join the over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp. They're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So, hey, if you're a counselor, BetterHelp is looking for you. And of course, there's a special offer for my listeners. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Michelle. Again, get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash Michelle. Hey, everyone. We're Mike, Scott, and Jason from Podcast The Ride. On our podcast, we discuss the world of theme parks and themed entertainment. Animatronic bears. Fake rock work. The logistics of theme park parking garages. So please check out and subscribe to Podcast The Ride only on the Forever Dog Podcast Network. New episodes every Friday. All right, let me let me actually bring you in because you to me are... My eyes almost get misty thinking about you, Gabe Liebman. I love you so much. Oh. I Michelle. miss getting burritos with you at 50th Street. I miss, oh. remember, we used to get margaritas together and just... It was so fun. The yeah. days. The well, days. We've known each other for a thousand years. I'm not kidding you that Gabe and I have, when we were Muppet baby versions of ourselves, <laughs> we knew each other. And I miss those days, but do I? Hmm. That's the thing. I would never go back, but I'm glad it happened. That's a beautiful thing to say. Let me introduce you because you... um I, I, there's so much that you're doing right now. And it really, if anyone that I knew from college was just killing it, meaning I'd want them to kill it forever, it would be you. You, uh, obviously, comedian, writer, you've worked on a million shows, Kroll Show, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. You are the um, one of the executive producers of the Pen15 show on Hulu, which we're, obviously we're going to talk all about. But you also have a new, uh, you're the showrunner of a new animated show called Q-Force, which is coming to Netflix in 2021. It's a, well, you tell us about that too. Follow him on Insta and on Twitter at Gabe Liebman. Just my son, my father, my brother, Gabe Liebman. Hi, Gabe. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thank you for having me. The whole podcast is me introducing you. And then I'm like, that is it. Thank you so and much for being here. 
<laughs> Bye. All I want to do is now ask you about your father and your brother. But ask uh, what do you want to know? How are they? Oh my god, everyone's great. My dad Good. um has not left the house along with my mother since March sixth. Thoughts on wow. that? Well, so they're doing. I mean, doing it righter than most. But that's also an, a, an extreme version. Well, I'm afraid that I'm going to go home to see them and I'm going to get to their apartment and they're both just going to be covered in like pig's blood. Like, I'm afraid that they... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like really afraid that I'm going to go and be like, I'm here. And they're just, they're going to have like Wilson hand stamped on their face <laughs> and the cat's going to be disemboweled. And I'm like, what happened? What happened? <laughs> My mom and sister live together. Oh. And they live in this beautiful, adorable apartment, downtown Philly. They've lived together for a while now. And even before quarantine, they were calling each other Big Edie and Little Edie. Oh, no. (laughs) That is very (laughs) them, too. (laughs) That is very them. (laughs) That was their nickname for each other. And now, obviously, it has just gotten more extreme as the rest of the world has faded away. Um, It's just so crazy what we're living through right now. It's nuts. I'm glad that they have each other though, you know, cause it's nice. Yes. I, it, I'm sure that they're actually having fun. Your, your mom, your whole family is just like the light of my life. Like I love them. How's your brother doing? Another He's Columbia good. grad. My, my yes. year. Yeah. Eli. Yes. Yes. Your classmate. Yes. He's good. He's, he and his family, they're in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got two kids, and they're adorable. They just uh-huh. got um, iMessage accounts. So I How old texts. are they? They are nine and six. Wow, a six-year-old nine is and texting. Seven, maybe? Oh, my God. I don't know. The, I'm, she's I, not know. texting. I mean, she's doing uh, some FaceTime calls, and it's very fun. That's cute, though. Yeah, I'm it's very nice weird. to stay in touch. I, I'm curious... Without giving too much away, I'm a little bit weird about like my nieces following me on Instagram, even though I'm not like posting thought pics, although lately yeah. I've kind of delved there a little bit, but um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a strange, I don't like it. And I, and I love them. But it's just weird. Like I like there to be two separate worlds, but then I feel like a monster, not I let the little one follow me now. Cause I felt mean saying no. Right. Yeah. They're not on social media yet, but they, mm. every once in a while I'll get a, a like a text from my, my nephew to say like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I don't know. What do you say? Are you like, working? I'm like I just walked the dog or oh. I'm making lunch. I try and I do a lot of exclamation points. He does none. Um, oh, he's I, serious I'm, like that. He's negging me. I think, I think he like wants me to perform. Like I'm so interested in you and he's yes. like, yeah, whatever. You know, I think that that's how Eli is. So that's sort of clocks yeah. for me. <laughs> <laughs> if memory serves, Eli was identical. So I don't yeah, think I've ever, s- lot. I don't think I've ever seen him like use an exclamation point, even just talking. <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> very measured, very measured, very measured. But unlike you, you're not measured at all. Gabe, you're no. a, an ex- wild, explosive, wonderful <laughs> creature. Creature is such an offensive term. I every time creature. I like it. Do you? I don't like it. It's true. Because I feel like when people call me a creature, they mean like an orc from Lord of the Rings, not like a cute like creature. <laughs> You're not an imp. Yes. Not a, a a woodland fairy. <laughs> I'm like born from the mud. I've got pecs. I'm like, what the fuck? Why am I that creature? Um. So wait. So the family's good. I like to hear that. How's Daniel? Daniel, he's you're- good. He's yep. um he's been really productive during this quarantine thing, which is like inspiring because he's he's an author, mm-hmm. and so it's like even though we're both writers, he has he's kind of in charge of his own productivity in a way that I'm not. I have deadlines, yeah, and I have people bugging me, and I know when something is due and when to say, okay, I'm done with this because it just has to be done. Mm. Um, whereas he's really just like on top of his own thing and he's like it's very interesting to watch like he has himself on his own schedule and he's really like putting stuff out there which is i hate that i hate it like i i just know i could not do it what sign is he he's a scorpio Hmm. and you are i am a taurus oh my favorite male sign gabe liebman did you know that I didn't, but I do feel compatible. I love you. And it's, you know what? It's like the no drama sign. Like it's like the men who I, I, I don't know a lot about female Tauruses, but the male Tauruses that I've known, they're straightforward. They're kind, confident, um, like no bullshit in a way that I really like. God, that's what I want to be. Okay. You that's are good. that. I think that's you really good. are. Yeah. Everyone, everyone is, uh, associates stubborn. That's the first word you get when you say Taurus. And I'm like, 
I guess I am. It's not something you would know about yourself if you're stubborn or not. That's something that other people have to tell you whether That's you're true. stubborn. Um, but yeah, it's nice to hear no drama. I, I'm going to take that with me. Stubborn seems also like the kind of word no one uses anymore. Now it's like self-important or now it's right. like the word stubborn sounds like something from Mary Tyler Moore. Like, oh, stop being yeah. so stubborn. You know, now it's like, stop being a fucking asshole. Like, exactly. Right. Yeah. Who the fuck do you think you are? Yeah. Oh, stubborn. <laughs> Got it. Stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> I've been watching Mary Tyler Moore in my quarantine. It's so funny. The first time. It's so funny it's the best oh my god did you ever watch the dick van dyke show back in the day no and i have to uh, I, so funny you'll shit that's the one that's in a right takes place in a writer's mm-hmm. room yeah i've heard nothing but the best stuff about that well you'll recognize like every person from it because they all eventually became one of the old people on seinfeld like every oh. <laughs> every person young on the dick van dyke show lived with uh morty and all of them in oh del boca vista you know so it's Amazing. a nice tie-in for that i can't wait to be old i feel like I, I just want, I want it all to end, but not in a suicidal way, just like enough already, you know? Not, we've done it. We've done we it. We have done it. Don't you feel grateful? Because I think you and I are around the same age. You're, you're younger than me. What did you just turn 38, I'm guessing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm 82. 82 and I'm 81. So uh, don't you feel though, like kind of grateful that we're this, although I'm single, so it's a little different, but that we're at this age during this particular time in history? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like watching the younger generation grapple with the, even the idea of quarantine is heartbreaking because it's, I know exactly what they're thinking is like, you know, the, the reports are, you know, now all the, most of the infections are happening to people in their twenties because they just can't stay inside. Can't stay like, inside. I know. I was a maniac in my twenties. Mm-hmm. I didn't do anything healthy. And no one could tell me what to do either. So I totally fucking get it. And of course, the economy, it it scares me so much for the younger people. It's really scary that like people who are looking for work right now, because even when we were, let's say, you know, when I was in my 20s and I was dying to work in TV, those jobs paid zero and they were horrible, but at least we were getting them. Do you know what I mean? After exactly. like with hard work, we we were able to do that. And I'm like, how do you even get hired at anything now? Because everyone is out of work. So like... Yeah. What do you do? And what do you, and, and there's no help coming. That is, I it know. just scares the shit out of me. But look I, at us, yeah. you know, where, but forget the youngs. <laughs> and then mentally, I feel like we're at a good place. Yeah. We're like old enough to know, to be responsible and to absorb the terror of it all. Like, that's right. it's just like, I think we're, we're the generation that's just never going to forget that this happened, hopefully. And maybe also because we were young when 9-11 happened, so we've already been through a trauma. Yeah. And it's, you know, and we were old enough to remember it crisply. Inclu- we were probably two blocks away from each other when 9-11 happened, by yeah. the way. But what dorm were you in uh, junior year? I was in the, I was actually living in a Barner dorm really? at the time. Yeah, the one above Ollie's on 116. Uh, we w- uh, babe, we were a block away because I went to the Salzburger Tower. So I was on 117th. You were, we were a block away from each other in 9-11. And that's the show. We got to go. That's, that's the show. <laughs> Gabe Lehman, watch Pen15. <laughs> I'm like, coming up on Loose Change 2. Uh, oh, I'm my sorry. God, we'll happen. take that out. But yeah, it's... um. Oh my god, Ollie's. I still haven't watched it. I'm I should watch it. No, why I would you watch haven't. it? Why would you? I wouldn't have a watch it. Because it comes up enough. And, and and everyone has like a knee-jerk joke about it. I still I'm like, I, it's one of those things where I pretend I know what people are talking about, but I don't. The only thing I know about it is that their suggestion is the um I'm sure you know this, that the building could not have melted from exactly. the heat of the plane. But yeah. then I'm like, well, wouldn't even one floor collapsing bring the whole shit down? That's what I would think. You know? <laughs> But we, certainly you don't you don't crash an airplane into a building every day <laughs> you know it's, god we, we're it's laughing because it's ordinary. horrifying yeah, yeah we'll yeah. edit this whole thing out um so Gabe, <laughs> hey trace can we uh edit that whole loose change part out i'm like and by the way q and on onto something coming up next oh no, god my forbid. god see that's another I thing i don't want to know about i can't act that i actually can't stop in like reading about no you're joking i, am, I can't why stop it Ooh, it's just scary. It's crazy. And it's like just getting bigger also because putting on a show called Q Force and I think should it be called that? Oh my God. It Are you going to change the name? Well, I've like gone back and forth a million times and I keep ending on no. And I consult a lot of people about it and, and the advice is sort of like, don't, don't mm. seed, 
but it is scary. It's, well, you still have like just, a year to do something. Yeah, still about here. It. I'll figure it out. Yeah, you should just start a group called Queer and On, and then re <laughs> you have to rebrand Q and On basically in order to make it fit for your show. Right. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I mean, also, yeah, it's just, it's yeah. crazy. But I have a neighbor who was wearing a QAnon shirt. Shut the fuck up. And it's just, you know, it just like shows up. Um, what did it say? It's not going away. It said, we are Q with a, with a fl- an American flag in the Q. And then there was these other letters under it. And that's what I Googled to make sure, um, oh, this is QAnon. To and make sure he wasn't was- going to like murder you, a Jewish gay man, by yeah, the way. I'd also exactly. be frightened from yeah. that. What um, yep. what did you find out from the letters? Um, it's, it, it's an acronym for like where we go, blah, blah, blah. I think that, or I don't know. It was, it was, it was like W W one W G A or something like that. And it, it, it's like where one of us goes, we all follow or something like that. I didn't, it didn't sink in obviously, but that was, that was what tipped me off. My whole thing is that Gabe lives in Los Angeles and I'm assuming a pretty liberal part of town. So, yeah. uh, I mean, all of LA is pretty liberal ex- unless you're like very wealthy, I feel, or like, I don't know, but that, yeah. that anybody who can like, afford rent or buy uh, can afford to buy a home that a homeowner when I'm a renter believes in QAnon that does spiritually yeah. break me down a little bit. There is the scary, the scary thing is that there's this overlap through hippiness. Really? That is this oh, it's other a wellness way in. thing, right? Yeah. It's a wellness me. thing. And it's people who are skeptical of like vaccinations mm. and people who don't want to wear a mask because they don't want to limit their oxygen flow. And it's not the only way in is no longer Trump. There's also this new hippie way in and it's the scary, the the overlap in the Venn diagram is, is surprising. It's just, um, can I, can I make a guess? Scary. Yeah. Whites. White. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to guess. Yeah. Whites. Okay. (laughs) I just want to make sure I'm getting it right. Yeah. There is some overlap white whiteness yes. done <laughs> all right just wanted to get that out of the way um correct yeah yeah that is really scary i i find it's funny because netflix has been putting out a lot of these documentaries about like wellness and just all there was one i watched about drinking and uh, there's one about diets and all these things oh. and i started watching them and i'm like wait I know that the idea of these behind these documentaries is to educate and to show you that like, yeah, maybe getting your face stung with bees won't make you look young. That was something I watched, um, <laughs> which by the way, immediately I was like, or bee stings. Like they use tweezers to get the bees. I was like, cute tweezers, bees. Yeah, could be cute. <laughs> so A beard of bees. Cute. But I realized that like, they can make me feel bad. I was like watching them. And I'm like, I actually, like, honestly, the vow I, first of all, I have a lot of issues with the vow. I do not like it oh, at all. Yeah. I think it's a, t- oh yeah, it's terrible. It's not the right narrators. It's literally like watching, you know what it reminds me of? It's like watching a city council meeting on C-SPAN where I'm just like, <laughs> is someone talking right now? Like, is there, are there, it's almost yeah. like they didn't have an editor. They're just like, just toss all the footage together and hope people can find their own narrative within this thing. It's confusing. And, and Mark and Sarah are not cured. You like, don't think they're, they're cured? Go on. No, I don't think they're cured. I think that they are both freaked out that it got sexual, but the way they talk about the program and the five days and the binders and the sashes and all of that stuff, I actually think they still think that that all works. And that makes me not trust them. Well, anyone who would fall into a cult, I always think which cult would I go into? Because uh-huh. I, I think I would be easily, I, I like to believe that I'm not gullible and I yeah. like to believe that I'm really tough I'm actually dumb and I've been tricked before and I could see myself oh. getting tricked again. And, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of half joking because I feel like anything that has any kind of cult connection freaks me out. Like even driving by the Scientology building in LA, I didn't like driving by it. It's scary. It just didn't feel good. And like, you see the volunteers and oh, yeah. They're, I, yeah, they're, they're single-handedly keeping the um, short sleeve button down industry in business. The Scientologists. <laughs> I'm like, oh, they're buying those shirts. Go okay, on. Hey, got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, honestly, what would keep me out of a cult is that they're so expensive. That's true too. But you know, you would think, yeah, but it's helping me. That's, you know, I remember in LA, I used to go, uh, there was a clinic. What if I <laughs> 
Oh my God. Oh my God. No, there was a clinic in Hollywood that actually was great. They had really a wonderful staff there and it was really easy. You didn't have to make an appointment. You could walk in. And that was where the Scientologist, I guess they had to have some medical exam to do something. I don't know what the inner workings are of it. Oh, wow. Which kind of surprised me because they do seem, considering how like anti-therapy they are and anti-medication and things like that, I'm surprised they would even send them to like a normal doctor. But unless I was secretly, unless I was going to a Scientology doctor, I don't (laughs) think I was. It was under a dispensary. So there was something already very shady and weird about it. But And you did have to hold a can for 20 minutes. (laughs) Yeah, it was so weird. Like before they would see me, they would make me tell them my deepest, darkest secrets, but then they would give me aspirin. So I just kept going. And yeah, (laughs) but I remember like there was one story where I walked in and there was a woman sitting in the waiting room who, you know, I didn't know that she was a Scientologist, but she she was uh, overweight and, you know, living her life, God bless, and sitting. But she looked like she had been through some stuff. I was like, okay, that woman, you know, you see a lot of things in L.A. I was like, all right. And then walked in this like supermodel, I mean, stunning, tall, blonde woman, like gorgeous, skinny. And she put her name in and they sat near each other. And this woman was reading, the blonde was reading like this comic book that I guess was some kind of Scientology, like indoctrination pamphlet. Oh, wow. And the other lady was like, I'm reading that too. And then I watched as these two just chatted, like when I tell you the two ends of the bell curve uh, of what is yeah. considered, um, according to the media, you know, uh, not me, but according, it just two very different looking people. I'll put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was just like this, maybe this cult is good. <laughs> like, look, it's bringing these. Two- <laughs> I was like, look, these two can chat. chat about. Yeah. I was like, that's nice. But then I was also like freaked out. Like, what are they testing them for? Where are they sending them to the boat? Like, where are they going? You know, it was freaky. I don't know. The whole thing there freaks me out. It's freaky. Anyway, neither of us. Okay. That. Okay. Neither of us fell for what I think Uh is. Okay. It's not, not, it's not a cult, but it has a lot in common with a lot of these programs. Neither of us really got sucked into UCB. Funny. You say that. Wow. Okay, can I just I, say something? Tell me, price, talk to people okay. about, tell people who don't know what UCB is, what it is, because I have obviously a lot to say. Go for it. Okay, so UCB is like um, an improv and sketch comedy training school that started in New York City, popped up in LA. They got really, really big. And for a long time there, it felt like this is something you need to buy into to have a career. Correct. And... Um, I, you and I both did improv prior to in school, sort of what, yeah, in school um, while, while living another life and then, you know, enter the world, want to get into comedy, want to work in entertainment. Yeah. And that seemed like this way that you could sort of buy into it. Um, I did do UCB 101 and it turned me off because I felt like it's this very prescribed plan that costs a shit ton of money. So much money. So how much, much Do you remember money. how much you paid? My, I think back then the class was like 350 Yeah. Or something like that, which, you know. For eight broke, weeks or something. But yeah, yeah, for was, eight weeks for like a broke 22 year old. Yeah, it's a lot. It's almost your whole rent. Um, and it's, you know, in New York city where your rent is 100% of your income always. Um, so I, it freaked me out and there was this sort of like Lord of the flies sort of power structure to it. That's what scared me the most was like all the people who hold the power here are like 18 months older than me. Like who, why are they in charge? It was yeah. so scary. It's and It's funny weird that and, you call it yeah. a cult. I don't. I don't know if I would call it that. And I should yeah, add, like, I don't think it's actually a cult. I, no, no, I no. should, I should make that clear, but there are, there's some things in common. No, no, and no. When you hear people use the, like the one ones or, you know, like, uh, there's, there's terminology that doesn't not sound like Nexium and Scientology. I've never, I actually GCM have never and all that shit. thought about that before until you just said it. You're uh, 100% right. I should start by saying that I was lucky in that I, um, 
was able because UCB, the name carried so much weight with it that people were like booking shows because they were UCB, like SNL would, you know, go to UCB to as a feeder for their cast. So it was, you know, there was like a lot of prestige involved just being a part of UCB. And I did my, um, my show magic mission XXL for a long time, starting in LA. And then I brought it here to New York. And I will say that I, Loved the theater. Like the reason why. Loved it as a venue. Loved as, a venue. as a venue. And I will, sp- but, but I'm going to say something about that, which is that the venue you couldn't, and now they all closed basically. I think LA is still open. There's one, they opened one on the West side and we're talking after taking, I mean, hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, they must've earned so, so, so much oh, money yeah. and they somehow still tanked. And for the listener who doesn't understand this, I would do a show. They would sell out 95% of my shows were sold out. They yeah. would only charge $7 a ticket. That was not up to me, by the way. Now I'm all for, you know, we're talking here about young people going to see comedy. I'm all for, um, do, you know, not charging a lot for tickets. However, sure. why couldn't they, they paid me when I tell you zero dollars, I mean that I wouldn't even get cab fare home and I had to bring all my shit with me. I had to yeah. be responsible. I wouldn't get paid a cent. Never once got a check from UCB. So I used to think, well, can't they make the ticket $15 or even 10 and give me at least so I can go buy myself dinner after the fucking show after I've sweat here? You know what I mean yeah. by that? It was. And if they're not paying the talent then pay all of your hundreds of quote unquote interns. They paid nobody and people were chomping at the bit to work there and to perform there, including myself, because the name had so much recognition. We thought, well, the name is worth it all. And frankly, I will say that that being all said, they were some of my favorite shows. Like I loved performing there, but eventually I started really getting bitter. And I was like, you know, this is, and this is why I think that they frankly tanked because People got pissed. There were unions, people trying to unionize about it. I don't know enough about the ins and outs of it, but it became a real problem for them. And listen, I love Amy Poehler. I love Matt and all the guys who started it. They're lovely people. I've met most of them and some of the funniest people ever. But what a bad call on their part. And I hope to still one day work with all of them. So please don't let this change. (laughs) I know. It's not a cult. It's not a cult. But... For an like, example of how you and I might not fall into a cult, there on. were a lot of people who got real deep in there, got treated like shit, yeah. got nothing out of it other than maybe some friends. And I mean, and that's not knocking the art form. I actually, a lot of people shit on improv. I would say improv. Oh. I don't, Mind blowing. You know, maybe Mind it's blowing. not the funnest thing to watch always, but it changed everything about me for the better. Here I sound like I was in a cult. But, no, but it's true. Uh, no, this is your yeah. this is your like art form. I mean, not to sound like a fucking asshole. Listen, the ASCAT performers, when I would do monologues there, I used to watch them and think, I cannot believe their brains. Like I my stand-up is pretty much improvised for the most part. You know, I I fuck around a lot. Yeah. But I couldn't do what they do, which is work with someone else. I couldn't do it. It's impossible. It's to unbelievable. Me. Yeah. And they're incredibly talented. No, they're actually brilliant people. So we're we're really kind of talking about two separate things, which is the talent, you know, they, they really did no pun intended Harold, big talent there. But yeah. another thing that I remember reading about, and this is funny that I would even like get remotely incensed about this. You're really going to laugh is that if you were a woman who took the classes and you were remotely attractive from what I heard, they couldn't treat you any worse that they treated specifically. Really? Have you never heard that? No. Yes. There were, I- if you were beautiful, like, if you, weren't if you were a pretty girl who came there, exactly, it was like, yeah, turn the world on its head and probably out of stemming from like the bitterness of so many male comedians being rejected their whole lives. Um, right. They really took it out on attractive women who, who paid for the classes. And I was oh, like, my God. by the way, wouldn't it be funny where I'm like, well, and I said, thank God I never paid money. No. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm like, I'm king of the UCB. Let me like rewind the clocks. I'm running the shit. I'm like, wait a minute. (laughs) There's two different timelines. The one where I did it and I become really successful. And then I read that article and I'm like, wait, what? Wait. Hey, Midnight Snackers. It's a very exciting day here on the podcast. I don't know uh, whom amongst you follows me on Instagram, but a few months ago, I posted very proudly that I got an electric bike from Aventon and I have literally fallen in love with my bike. And I thought, you know, because it was electric that I actually wouldn't get as much exercise from it than from your regular bike. But um, take it for me, fitness guru, Michelle Collins, that you actually do get a workout. It's basically a regular bike. But if you're like me and you're not like in top shape, you know, you can go anywhere you want. If you run out of steam or whatever it is, you can just flip that battery right on and it 
takes you where you need to go. So it's sort of the perfect bike for all occasions. You can go far. You can go on a quick ride. Um, you get to choose the level of assistance you want from one to five. And, uh, you know, you don't need the assistance, but I love the assistance. You don't even need to pedal when you turn that stuff on. It just takes you right into it. Uh, it makes it great for exercising, commuting, or just cruising around, enjoying the breeze through your freshly cut hair. And guess what? I love Aventon. I want you to love it too. So here's the deal. We're giving one lucky listener, could be you, an Aventon e-bike. That's right. You can win one of these for yourself. You have to go to Aventon. I, I'm saying another way it's spelled. Aventon, A-V-E-N-T-O-N dot com slash midnight snack to enter your chance at winning a brand new e-bike. And guess what? You've got till November 30th. May we all live that long to enter this giveaway. So spend the next few months just entering over and over again. Aventon.com slash midnight snack. Gling gling. That's me wishing you good luck. There's a little bit of that going on in the vow when it's like, oh, yeah. did you pick up on that where it's, seems almost like, well, why wasn't I invited to like have sex with him? Have sex with him. By the yeah. way, I was like personally uh, traumatized when they were saying that they that he would only pick skinny women. I'm like, Keith, yeah. Keith couldn't handle all this. That is true. No. Keith, I would literally crush the man's glasses would be fogged up and cracked three minutes <laughs> in. You know, so I get it, but also like, ugh, I don't like it. It's so gross. It's so gross. I hate and the I don't I don't think there's nine episodes there. Oh, I think there's nine total. Been. Guys, yeah, my, like I just that, lost like, use of my arms. I'm full diving bell butterfly right now. I but can't. But nothing happens week to week in a weird way. It's, Did you listen to the podcast that I can't, was like an, I can't give it okay. any more energy than I've already given yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of a repetition and it, the podcast is mostly um narrated by Sarah also. So it's like mm. a lot of the same stuff over and over again. Um, it's an awful situation, obviously, but I do think that they should have found someone more objective to tell that story because mm. I don't trust this Mark Vicente dude to tell I know. that story. I could all. see myself being lured into a cult by him, not Keith. By Mark? Yeah. You Well, you love an accent. I love an accent. I love a tall, gray-haired like real Muppet face. That's really yeah. my, my <laughs> style, you know? So I, I, I look at him and I'm like, although I don't love the South African accent, I find it sometimes to be a little grating, but, um, I do, I could see my Keith. I'm like, are you get the fuck out of here? If this guy are even came up me? to me, I would <laughs> face palm him so fast into a ditch. People would be like, Keith, are you okay? <laughs> it's He's outrageous. Disgusting. It's outrageous. Oh my God. This is my new wave shit. Like, you know, even people who go do now I'm about to, Oh, Actually, do you know what's a good show, though? Okay, wait. You know, I've never talked about watching the show. I have a show that I watch in secret. I've oh never, God. I know, I've never actually brought it up because I don't think anyone else is watching it, but I love it. So it's on TBS. It's called Lost Resort. Have you heard of it? No. Lost Resort. Yes. Great title. It's really good. It's called Q Resort. No. And... <laughs> It's a bunch of queers. Um, conspiracy queers. Conspiracy queers is a good name for something, though. That is kind of good. Gabe, you know my dream is to write something with you. <laughs> I would love to. I would love to. Please, I hope they put this in the video. Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember I had a call with my agent like years ago, and they were trying to find a writing partner for me, which obviously never happened. And they were like, um, we have this guy in mind, Gabe Liebman. I was like, get the fuck out of here. I'll call Gabe. You don't need to connect us. Like, I'll text him. Anyway, uh, Lost Resort is really good. It's a show where they took eight troubled people um, who are like, what, some of them are very anti-therapy and they send them to this like beautiful jungle with all these super spiritual new wave. There's like a sex expert and like there's this, oh my God. and everyone is into like drumming and just screaming into the abyss and that kind of energy, super yeah. hippy dippy, but they're like normal people from like Schenectady. Like it's not. LA people, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's like a mother and daughter who hate each other. There's a guy, a gay guy with big anger issues there. There's like this hot black guy who I swear to God, they haven't spent any time in him. I'm like, he seems great. Like, why is he there? He's like <laughs> hot and really nice, but he's like family things. There's a girl who I can't stomach who's like, doesn't want to be there, but it sort of does make the show good because you're like, well, go. Like, if you don't want to be there, get the fuck out of there, but she won't leave. Right. It's really a good show and no one talks about it. I'm like, I don't know. How long has it been on? Like I'm weeks watch and weeks and weeks. And it's <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> you check. It's like never existed. I completely made it up. Yeah. You're like, wait. <laughs> wait. 
should write that. I should. Conspiracy Queers on TBS. <laughs> Uh, it's it's a great show though, and the it's fun. What I was going to say though is that I am someone who is against a lot of new wave, a new age stuff because it does kind of frighten me. And even some of the stuff they do on the show, I think why I like watching it is I'm like I would not be able to get up in front of a group of strangers and do some inventive dance and then scream right. into a bucket. Like it just would, <laughs> I wouldn't do it. Like it's just, I would literally be like the girl I don't like and say. No, <laughs> like, no. <laughs> would you do so? Would you ever like lean into that? I don't think I could. I don't think so. I think I'm too self conscious, and I think I'm too skeptical. Yeah. Too. Would you ever do ayahuasca? I'm scared. I am I, too. I like did some like acid and mushrooms <gasps> in college. You know, when I was like young, yeah. and it just was too much for me. Can you like? Can you tell me what happened to you? Because I've never done either of those things. Okay. I would say that every single time it just lasted longer on me than Mm. everyone else. So there was this like weird, like moment. I only did it maybe a handful of times, but there would be a weird moment where everyone else was like sober and I was still just like tripping. And the worst was, I remember (laughs) this was at Columbia. It was like, um, we had done acid with my little friend group and everyone else was coming down and they were like, let's walk down to the river. Let's just like look at the river. And (laughs) instead of just walking like to Riverside park and taking a path down to the river, they ran across um, Riverside drive and the highway. What? Yeah. And I was still so scary on drugs and was so fucking scared and everyone else was like obviously looking both ways and I was just trusting them but it's like that was so scary and I was just like yeah I don't need I don't think I need this and another time this was a a great experience Uh um (laughs) but it just was like a little too much (laughs) did acid during the day and went to the when the planetarium at the natural history museum was like new um we did acid went to Central Park. We, like, bought tickets, went to Central Park um, to, like, wait for the drugs to ki- kick in, then go to the show, and it started raining, <laughs> like, oh really God. hard while we were in Central Park. So then we walked into the planetarium soaking wet, looking like complete drugged-out ragamuffins, and the rest of the... I mean, it was, like, a 2 p.m. showing at the planetarium. <laughs> Everyone else there was on a field trip. Like, it was just... <laughs> Like hundreds, hundreds of, of school children. Oh my god! And I was just like stinking of cigarettes and clearly on drugs and soaking wet. And I just felt so shitty about myself. That's fun though. It I was like really kids. fun. You know, I do it. I, I by the sheer height of my body, like I have frightened children before just by like being a little too close without them knowing. Like there have been moments like that. But it's funny. I, I always say that if I. Because you, Gabe knows very well, maybe more than anyone else. Gabe has actually seen me high when we were in school together. Oh, yes. And funny enough, those were probably the two best experiences I've had. I remember one time singing the national anthem for all of you. I was just going to say, I was just going to say the time you sang. Which I sang it in male opera, and I remember everyone's head exploding. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you have a beautiful Mm. singing voice. Thanks, Gabe. Famously. Mm. And yeah, I mean... Okay, you were all, we were sitting on the floor in my dorm room, <laughs> which I shared, and there was bunk beds. Mm-hmm. And weirdly, and this is so not me, but there was an American flag yes. on the wall. There was. That was huge. I remember I it. Where the, I don't know where we got that thing. I don't know what. I would never hang an American flag on the size of a wall on a wall of somewhere I live now. It's just such a weird well, mess. This if is we not lived in a, American, but I, I was going to say if imagine. we lived in a, you know, in a different country. I was also very into flags though in college, and yeah, um, I was a real flag so cool. hag. And I had a huge <laughs> thank you. I had a huge Union Jack on my wall because I'm such an Anglophile piece of shit. Oh my god! That I had this, and I lo- I had that flag from my. I brought it with me from my house in Miami to college because I loved it so much. It was just a yeah. different time back then. It was like the late 90s, it was. you know? It's yeah. yeah. And there you were sitting on the floor in front of American Black. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I remember it. And I sang and it so belting. deep. Yeah. And deep. Yes. 
It was like a man. I I rarely do that anymore because I'm so convinced my greatest fear in life is becoming a famous male opera singer before I've become (laughs) famous for being funny. So it's like, I don't want, you know what I mean? I don't want to have like Michigan J frog disease where all of a sudden people are like, do it, do the singing thing. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm also funny. Um, (laughs) The other time I remember being high, because you know that now I cannot do it at all. Like now I, I I did an edible with my friend Jason in like May. He came over and I luckily his husband is like a psychotherapist because we had to get him on the phone to like talk me off the fucking ledge. I was out of my mind. Oh my like it God, really just, no. just not agree with me. Uh, the other time I remember was, and I, I know we've talked about this before, so I'm like, are we out of stories? But when we were at 1020 together, our local college bar, which still yes. exists, by the way, and um, Guys and Dolls was on. It was me, you, Jenny Slate, and maybe Mike. Oh. I don't remember. Maybe Lang, someone else. But Jenny was for sure there because I, it was on mute, but I know the whole movie by heart. So I was just <laughs> doing the movie while it was on mute. And I remember like sobbing with laughter. I think we had a pot cookie or something. And I was yes! shooting tears like it's probably the hardest I've ever laughed in my life was that 1020 with you guys honestly those are the good good old days oh that bar with the mute with always a movie on mute on the back wall always Uh, but I I love that bar oh the best I do too yeah one of the best but yeah I won't do acid because as I often say here on the podcast I know that the second it touches my tongue I'm gonna see a devil so I'm like no thanks like yeah I can't and I won't yeah I'm too scared and it just lasts too yeah. long. We have a mutual friend. I don't know if I'll, I'll, I'll text you his name, but he did ayahuasca as oh. like um, a New Year's Eve uh, ritual type thing. And again, it lasted too long on him. And it was in like Malibu in this like rented yurt or whatever yes. for the ceremony. And, you know, then it was the next day. The trip was supposed to be over. Everyone was packing up their things. And the, you know, the yurt was rented by someone else <gasps> next. And they had to get him up and out of there. And he had to just like finish his trip, I think in his car, like by the side of the road where it's just like, did he, imprecise. did he vomit and did he go back yeah. into his childhood? I don't know what he like saw or experienced, but he definitely vomited and he definitely tripped and he said it was a really positive experience until suddenly it was supposed to be over and everyone else was done and he wasn't done. Like I relive my fucking shitty childhood every day. You think I need to yeah. like <laughs> puke in a bucket first to go back? Allow me to interrupt. I can do it literally with you on the podcast right now. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go. We have to go to break, meaning this is the end okay. of part one. Um, Gabe Liebman, we're going to talk about Pen15 uh, on the next episode with Gabe because it's speaking of bad childhoods. I mean, it, I was going to say reliving your childhood for sure. It's really for me like genuinely I am both of those girls and I, I'm just yeah. everybody. I'm everybody on the show. Genuinely rolled into one. Um, it's probably the best show on television. It's on Hulu. Um, we're going to talk all about uh, Pen15 with Gabe Liebman. Follow Gabe. Just truly one of my favorite people on the planet at Gabe Liebman on uh, Instagram and on Twitter. And um, and we'll talk about his new show Q Force, his QAnon cartoon uh, <laughs> on the next episode. So we'll see you guys then. Bye. Earlier in the episode, you guys heard me raving about how much I love riding my electric bike that I got from Aventon. So just a reminder, these bikes are super fun. You know, it can be a little intimidating at first, but I'm telling you that once you get the kick of it, you're going to be hooked. The kick of it? I invented it and I'm going with it. It'll be tough to ever go back to a traditional bike. And like I said, the folks over at Aventon now wanted to hook our listeners up with a brand new electric bike of your very own. They just unveiled this new model. It's called the Level Step Through Commuter (gasps) E-Bike. I want it. That's not even the one I have. And they're giving one away to one lucky listener. So if you want a chance to win, I suggest you head over to aventon.com slash midnight snack to enter. While you're there, check out their full line of e-bike models. I have the Pace 500. And let me just tell you, my legs swing over it. I feel like I'm I'm getting on big horse. I love it. There's no way you're not going to have a blast riding one of these things around town. Just take it from me. Again, go to aventon.com slash midnight snack. You're going to enter before November 30th. That's a cool nearly three months. You have to enter this for a chance to win your very own Aventon electric bike. Good luck. I'm really rooting for you, specifically you. And thanks for listening. Forever. Dog. This has been a Forever Dog production. Midnight Snack with Michelle Collins is executive produced by Brett Boehm, Joe Cilio, and Alex Ramsey. 
Produced by Tracy Soren. Original theme music by Gabe Lopez. Cover art by Ben Wiseman. For more original podcasts, please visit foreverdogpodcasts.com and subscribe to our shows on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Keep up with the latest Forever Dog news by following us on Twitter and Instagram at Forever Dog Team and liking our page on Facebook. <laughs>